Thank you so much, um, uh, Gemma, for this uh, kind introduction. And at this point, I would like to uh, thank all the organizers, but especially you and Gevor for their kind um, invitation to be part of this um, uh, high profile um, event. Uh, before I start um, uh, my presentations, these are my declarations of, of interest. And yes, um, I use the terminology of humanitarian crisis for this presentation because uh, when we refer to humanitarian crisis, we tend um, to emphasize only on cancer. However, when we look at terminology and the manifestations of the crisis, we do realize quickly that we're speaking about critical threats, for example, uh, to health, safety and the security of well-being. Uh, we are referring to uh, situations that create amongst uh, communities high levels of mortality or malnutrition, spreading of disease and epidemics, and other health um, emergencies. So there are other types of humanitarian crises that go well beyond um, war in, in itself. So we do have natural disasters, which uh, include, for example, geophysical, hydrological, meteorological, climatological, or biological, such as the recent epidemic of SARS-CoV-2. Of course, we do have man-made emergencies, which include armed conflicts, plane and train crashes, fires, and other industrial accidents. And of course, in most cases, what we're referring to when we are speaking about humanitarian crisis are complex emergencies. So when we have, for example, armed conflicts, at the same time, we also have displaced populations, food insecurity, and this is just to mention a few. And needless to say, these complex emergencies are the most difficult and challenging for health systems, governments, and organizations to deal with. So why are we here and we're speaking about humanitarian crisis? What does this uh, presentation, this um, uh, webinar is serving for? So let's, let's look at some of the numbers that have been published in this domain. For example, how many forcibly displaced people, including refugees, asylum seekers, internally displaced people, and other people in need of international protection were there in the world at the end of 2022? So think of a number, and I will give you the accurate number. It's 110 million. And the situation gets worse if we reflect on the percentage of refugees and other people in need of international protection, which are hosted in low and middle income countries. How many of those, of those 110 million? 76%, which means countries with less resources and capabilities to respond to those complex emergencies, they are hosting the most refugees and other people in need of international protection. In this um, uh, slide here, you can see some areas in the world where there are active conflicts and humanitarian crises at the moment. And this is where the 110 million of people are accumulated as refugees and other people needing of international uh, protection. They account for 1% of humanity and 90% of refugees. So why are we speaking about humanitarian crisis? It has become a, a global phenomenon. Across the world, we have seen humanitarian crisis that are becoming more frequent, more complex, and more long-standing. Fragility, conflict, and violence present a critical health and development challenge. The number, as we have seen previously, 
of forcibly displaced people has been increasing steadily. Conflict, forced immigration, and displacement has put an enormous pressure on healthcare systems. And this was mentioned earlier, including those of neighboring countries. And this leads to treatment disruptions, fragmentation, poor outcomes, not only for cancer patients, but all those patients needing in health, health care. So preceding studies have systematically demonstrated that humanitarian crises can lead to increased incidence of non-communable diseases with an increased disease burden and increased morbidity elaborated by higher disability adjusted life years and higher mortality. And these are very recent published data. So what is the exact impact on war and cancer? Of course, there are studies and research that have been made in terms of the impact of war on cancer. How many, however, the exact impact is very difficult to calculate or estimate. So for example, preceding studies have demonstrated that war can be responsible for higher incidence of cervical cancer in Vietnam, for example, higher incidence of breast cancer in the former Yugoslavia following uh, the immediate period after the wars, higher incidence uh, of gastric and testicular cancer was recorded in post-war period in Croatia. In Iraq, cancer-related deaths have been recorded. And this is just um, a, a fraction of the evidence demonstrating what the impact of war can be on cancer. Of course, war interrupts and prevents effective treatments when it comes to cancer. It exposes vulnerable people uh, to infections and threatening conditions. War diverts resources from cancer care. War can lead to delays in diagnosis as those involved, they prioritize seeking shelter and safety. And therefore, uh, by default, they tend to ignore concerning signs and symptoms when it comes to early symptoms of cancer. And of course, as we have, as we have seen in recent wars, hospitals and clin clinics are overrun, damaged, or completely destroyed. So what about war and its spillovers? So impact of war in neighboring countries, as we have seen, it's a reality. The rapid influx of refugees from countries experiencing this humanitarian crisis creates challenges for most public services in neighboring countries, including health services. Countries are struggling to cope with their own people being diagnosed, treated, and cared for cancer, additionally to fleeing refugees. For example, with millions of re Ukrainian refugees seek seeking protection and support across the region, fears were mounting that healthcare system in neighboring countries, such as Poland, for example, were quickly becoming overwhelmed, limiting access to essential healthcare services for patients with cancer. So if we, if we want to see these uh, the tip of the mountain, which uh, manifests as poor cancer care. It has other consisting, consisting elements, such as treatment interruptions, treatment fragmentation, delays in screening, and suboptimal sub uh, care outcomes. But what about other impacts of war, such as the impact of war on cancer research? So in times of humanitarian crisis, clinical cancer research finds itself in uncharted territory. Reasons for research compromise include, for example, lack of uh, safe conditions and environments, lack of personnel, clinical trial patients are becoming detached from their uh, trial sites as they have to seek um, shelter elsewhere alteration in the chain of supplies for devices, drugs, and others, improper conditions for meetings, suboptimal uh, communication systems and networks, 
external funding and sponsorship has been withheld or withdrawn. The presence of sanctions may, however, make reimbursements to clinical trials, uh, clinical trial sites more challenging, therefore hampering the ability of sites to take on new studies. Reluctance to initiate new trial sites will limit the available pool of for patients uh, for international clinical trials and may deprive Ukrainian and Russian patients from access to clinical trials and novel therapies. So clinical trials landscape in Ukraine and Russia. In February 22, uh, just before the Russian invasion, investigators in Ukraine were actively carrying out 584 clinical trials, 245 of which were for cancer. Of these, 127 were still in the process of recruiting. Russia, meanwhile, had 667 active cancer trials, 353 of which were still uh, recruiting. So how do trials can be effective, affected by war? According to Global Data's clinical trial database, over 70 foreign sponsored trials with a site in either Ukraine or Russia have been noted as disrupted by the war. It has taken many years for Ukraine to develop its strong cancer clinical uh, trials ecosystem including research ethics processes, contract research organizations, and high public trust. Such developments have been put at grave, grave risk by the ongoing co conflict. Since the start of the war, Ukraine has lost a large number of clinical research specialists and the human capital that will need to be rebuilt in the post-conflict era is a, an essential issue to be taken into consideration in the rebuilding on, of the uh, cancer trials landscape, both in Ukraine and Russia. What about SARS-CoV-2 and cancer? Beyond the deaths that are directly related to this infectious disease that also falls under the humanitarian crisis, increased mortality rates were recorded also due to delays in cancer diagnosis and treatment, as well as treatment interruptions. Evidence showed that more than 100 million of diagnostic text, tests were not performed due to the pandemic in view. Of those, 1 million patients were undiagnosed as a direct result of the pandemic. In the UK, for example, delays to cancer screening recorded a backlog of around 2.1 million people left waiting for breast, bowel, and cervical screen. During this time, around 3,800 cancers would normally be diagnosed through screen, but they haven't done so. In the UK, an increase in cancer mortality was estimated for the following years up to about 10% for breast cancer, 16.5% for colorectal, 5.3 for lung and 6% for esophageal cancers. Studies show that patients with lung cancer who are infected with COVID-19 disease have a seven-fold higher risk of developing a severe acute respiratory symptom with an estimate increase in mortality of up to 30% of more. And we have seen these uh, statistics manifesting in real clinical cases when uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was in full uh, deployment. So uh, a few things have been raised uh, by the previous speaker when it comes to uh, mitigation response to deal with this uh, humanitarian crisis. So as we have said in the beginning, humanitarian crises are becoming more complex situations and therefore they're requiring equally complex response. The crisis management starts before the onset of the crisis, or it should be, in order to be more effective in dealing with the crisis. So the, the model that I'm presenting to you here, the Jacques uh, relational model, has four primarily elements which uh, can find um, um, a relevance to the healthcare system around the world. 
So uh, health system should be built in you know, a crisis preparedness, crisis prevention, crisis incident management, and post-crisis management. Crisis is not a single entity. It has different constituent parts, which we can see through this model. And in order to be effective and successful, we need to be taking every um, uh, primary elements of this model into consideration. And each with clusters of activities and processes, all these uh, primary elements um, uh, interact uh, with each other. The model focuses on the importance of understanding the relationship among these elements and putting them in context of larger organizational management um, and diminishing uh, crisis related losses. We have uh, mentioned earlier, both by myself and the previous spe speaker, Dr. Terras, that um, we need to be re responding to this hum humanitarian crisis. It was mentioned that national cancer control plans is a way to do that, but also there are coalitions and networks that can also do this in a very effective way. I can, uh, I can mention here the European Cancer Organization ASCO Special Network. We have developed this network immediately after the war in Ukraine. It was one of the first, if not the first, response coming from Europe in terms of the war in Ukraine. And soon after we initiated this, uh, this coalition, we have represent, representations from over 300 organizations contributing in different ways uh, to the works of this network. With the help of this special network, we have set the oncohelp.org, aiming to provide multilingual resources signposting Ukrainian cancer patients and their families to relevant information available in different European countries receiving Ukrainian refugees, uh, cancer patients and their families. We have assessed and considered at the time that what the cancer patients and their family uh, needed at the time was um, the, the signposting, the ground uh, intelligence in how to reach other cancer centers, other facilities in neighboring countries in order to, or within Ukraine, in order to be able to continue um, uh, their treatment. And this is what the network has provided. And as, a, as other products that come uh, out uh, from this network was um, um, a, a combined effort to see uh, through a survey what were the cancer medicine shortages in surrounding countries during the war in Ukraine. And this was also an initiative that came out through the ECO ASCO Special Network. So as in, in conclu concluding this um, uh, brief overview of uh, the impact of humanitarian crisis on, on, uh, on cancer, we have seen that humanitarian crises are considered to be an outlier when assessing the state of global health. But these humanitarian crises are continuing to increase in frequency, duration, magnitude, and complexity. We cannot afford to deal or consider these humanitarian crises as outliers anymore. Patients with chronic illnesses, such as cardiovascular patients, diabetes, res respiratory conditions, and patients with cancers are one of the most vulnerable groups in the disastrous situations and encounter and continue to encounter various problems after humanitarian crisis. Cancer and other non-communable diseases are a severely neglected dimension of refugee health, even today, being ill-prepared for future crises. And if we are or continue to be ill-prepared for future crises, the consequence is thousands of potentially avoidable deaths from cancer among the refugee population and possibly deaths in neighboring countries due to overwhelming healthcare systems. So what we need to be doing is building back better, which is an approach to post-disaster recovery that 
reduces vulnerability for future disasters and builds community resilience to address physical, social, environmental, and economic vulnerabilities and shocks. Building Back Better applies to all aspects and sectors of post-disaster recovery. It, it requires a comprehensive approach in order to be effective. And Building Back Better offers the opportunity to rebuild stronger, safer, and more disaster resilient infrastructure and system. Because let's face it, humanitarian crisis will continue to happen all over the world. And they will continue to be more complex, more enduring, and more difficult to deal. So now is the time to do what? It's time to invest in people and systems. And with that concluding remark, thank you all for your attention. Thank you.